Um, so as I was hearing the stories of MG Motors, I, I couldn't think of anything else but this couplet from the legendary poem of Iqbal. Tu shahi hai, parvaz hai kaam tera, tere aage asma aur bhi hai. And I think, uh, thank you, hopefully we get some audience back now for uh, those who left. But I think uh, through this couplet, and I, as I was thinking about that, you know, I I want to, you know, focus this discussion on two key points that are coming from this this legendary poem, right? The first is parvas, which is flight, but you know, metaphorically ambition, dreams. And when you talk about women who are returning, I think one big conundrum is. How do you strike a balance between your ambition versus burning out? So we hear from the panelists. And I think the second piece that I do want to hear from the panelists, uh, which also resonates very well from this couplet, is Tere Aage Asma Aur Bhi Hai, which is freedom, flexibility, right? How, how do we sensitize our women that there are so many more options and there are so many things that they could do and achieve? So, so without further ado, I think uh, you know I'll, I'll come to the panelists and uh, I've, I've read a little bit of stories of how all these companies are doing, but Mukta, maybe I'll start with you. I think uh, if you could just throw some light in terms of what are some of the building blocks uh, when we talk about uh, you know retaining women who are losing uh, who we are losing out or you know uh, attracting them or you know the policies that we want to build at an organization level. Um, any story, especially at a frontline level, marks and expenses that you see. Sure, thank you so much, Neeta. Uh, what a beautiful way for you to kick this off. Uh, and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, uh, deliberating and talking and learning from each other on a topic that personally is very close to my heart, but equally important to create workplaces that thrive beautifully in this country. So I think, uh, you know, coming from Marks and Spencer, uh, we have a huge frontline workforce, and when we look at the narrative around how do we attract or retain talent. We are approximately 40% uh, women. Even at the leadership team level, we are actually 50% women. And uh, to me, I think it starts, the building block of it starts with ownership from the leadership team as well as the integration with our culture and, and creating a work environment that is psychological, uh, you know, psychologically safe for people to be able to express themselves. So you know, when we look at new, you know, expected mothers, now, you know, in a, in a typical store that you would have visited at Marks and Spencer or any other retail organization, you know, the frontline colleagues have to stand eight to nine hours a day. And to be able to do that while dealing with pregnancy is not an easy thing, right? So for us, you know, looking after colleagues and expected mothers is integrated in how we look at a policy framework for our people. And as it is disclosed to their store manager, respectively, you know, there are multiple health checks that are done and assessments around how risky is the pregnancy, uh, what kind of work can we allow them to do. Uh, we give them more frequent breaks for uh, various reasons. They're not allowed to pick or move heavy things. So, you know, that the whole work environment for an expected mother at a frontline store has to evolve significantly, and that's the, that's the environment that we've created. And all of this, you know, whether it's the leadership, ownership, around you know, the culture, is supported by practices of this kind that creates ownership at the classrooms level as well. And for us specifically, the line managers, the store managers play such a crucial role. We are spread across the country at you know, more than 35 locations. And it is that one store manager that creates that environment of inclusion, acceptance, and, and working with those store managers to ensure they understand why it's important for us and how they can support and just be, uh, you know, be nurturing of, of, uh, of people going through different life stages and integrated in our Growing Excellent Managers program. But, but having said that, um, you know, I personally think when we're able to retain a workforce of this kind, attraction also comes naturally because it just becomes such an integral part of your EVP and, uh, you know, 70% of our hiring actually happens to referrals. And it is these women colleagues that end up kind of referring to say, this is a great place to work, please come and join us because we know we will be taken care of. So I think it's, it's, it's the overall, in summary, the aspects around, uh, you know, culture, leadership, ownership, policies and practices 
flexible benefits, uh, work arrangements for our corporate, not just for store colleagues, but even for corporate office, and then uh, involvement from our line managers. Sure, thanks, thanks so much, and I think that's that's pretty insightful and also takes me to the next question of what you spoke about of implementing on the ground and maybe Pallavi I'll come to you, uh, especially in areas like supply chain, uh, you know, is a, is a male dominated area, uh, you know, what what are you doing at a more grassroots level with the managers and also how how do we sensitize women who are going to be on leave and they have their own fears, etc. So maybe you could throw some light in terms of you know the implementation level of this and how do we sensitize any any successful reintegration stories as well we would love to hear. Absolutely. See I think uh, when it comes to uh, women returning back or women uh, planning to go into maternity etc. Right? I think it works both ways. So how do you want to create an ecosystem that's favorable for women to, uh, you know, uh, during their maternity journey and further during their motherhood journey because it doesn't end really after they come back. You know, it goes on. Uh, and then, uh, and when it comes to ecosystem, you know, it's about, uh, uh, you know, shifting mindsets. You know, a lot of times we talk about policy, we talk about processes, you know, we have flexible work arrangements, we have
you should not tilt the balance to one side so much. That so then we start coming up with women centric, which means so in you know Pantanagar land uh, we have a women centric land which has 50 percent women and 50 percent men. So which makes all these cables for the for the trucks. So like this, when <coughs> we start out, uh, you know we realize that it's not about of course the numbers do matter. But then to change mindsets in the shop, we need to you know demonstrate that you know women can also do it. Uh, second, what we also did is we have a driver training institutes, traditionally you know uh, also supported by the governments. But most of them, if you see you know, it was all young boys who come uh, come to learn as drivers. Then we also initiated specific groups where we took only women, and uh, if you. Go and talk to some of these women. Uh, you will be surprised. Right? I was surprised to see that they didn't come here just to, you know, earn a livelihood or become a driver. Uh, some of them said, "I want to serve the country by joining the army as a driver, or by joining the CRPF, or I want to drive in the border roads." So we were really surprised that so it's not about, you know, driving for them as, as a way to earn a livelihood, but about a real passion. To you know, to drive and also to prove that uh, you know a big truck can be you know driven by women as well. So we are now hoping that we will sort of expand this to include other uh, roles in our ecosystem, like can we have all women mechanic shop, right? So we are trying to see as much as we can, but we are also conscious that sometimes uh, you know numbers do play an important role because when more people see, you know, women can do. So we are also working consciously to improve our numbers, but at the same time to challenge some of our mindsets. You know, when typically, you know, when we talk about a role, when somebody says it's not safe. So then I particularly ask the question: If it is not safe for women, is it safe for a man? So let us make the work environment safe, for irrespective of you know whoever it can be. And of course, to support, uh, we really come up with, you know, in my opinion. So very good policies where uh, any of our working mothers, if they want to return after their maternity leave, uh, they they have an option to work 50% uh, from office or 50% from home, or work entirely from home, depending on how their support system is, up to two years. And we don't change any of their. I mean, suppose if they say 50% I work from home and 50% office. It doesn't mean their sal salary remains unaltered, their role, everything remains you know, unchanged. So we thought that this first two years is the best way you can support a mother by allowing them the flexibility, you know, whatever they want. They can work full time in office up to 50 percent, or you know, be full time at home and still you know contribute to their. Then we also introduced policies like it's not just about the mothers, but sometimes women have or uh, they need this uh, primary caregiver time. Or a sabbatical, so we also come up with two years. You know, they can really opt to go out and you know provide that uh, to their family. Yeah. So these are some of the things you know we are trying to do. Oh, that's that's very interesting to hear, and I think uh, this is more a personal opinion that you know many a times uh, you get a promotion or you come back from a long leave and you are you are given a role and you act as a diversity candidate, which many of us don't like to hire. Uh, you know here, so. So the conversation has to move not just flexibility for women, but I think flexibility in general, because uh, it's not that men don't need it. They need it equally. It could be aging parents, or it could be any other reasons. And when you create that environment that it's not only for women, but in general a culture of flexibility, I think the acceptance level suddenly kind of goes up. Um, I think coming coming here to you and uh, taking taking cue from the earlier couplet of Parvas, right? Uh, one of the pieces that personally I feel uh, that happens is that when women return from work, uh, either it is that you know they they think that okay maybe I will not apply for a ambitious or a challenging role and let me take up you know some more transactional activities which will allow me flexibility. So. Uh, but at the same time, that reduces their ambition over time. Uh, so how do we strike a balance between ambition and not overloading them or a burnout, especially for working women? I mean, any any thoughts and experiences on what you've seen? 
thank you, Geeta, and you are a name sick, so <laughs> that's interesting. And um, quite agree with a lot of good examples, I think, that got shared for Ashoka and Flipkart and uh, MNS, and I'm also sure it is BC as well. I think it's um, hugely gratifying to see that there is some serious effort happening in the corporate space to ensure exactly this um, doesn't happen. So we have often heard of an ambition gap in women in the Middle Ages. I mean, it's true that your career peaks around the time that the life stage challenges for a woman also peaks. And that's reality. Irrespective of the profession that you're in, whatever job you're doing, if you're doing something outside of work, um, probably at the, around the 30, 20, mid 20s to mid 30s, is when you're, you are at your best in a lot of ways at work. And that's also the time you get married and probably move cities and also have your first child and eventually few years time a second child. So this is a challenge. And that's the period when um, biologically and maybe nature designed us like that, that you start to prioritize a young life more than anything else in, in your world at that point in time. And, and genuinely want to give it uh, your best shot. So uh, in a woman's mind, the priorities naturally shift. But from my own experience of having two children, and my daughter is now 27 and son is 22. So <laughs> from my own experience in, of having you know, gone through this journey. Um, I think that period of time when there is an addition, uh, I would say, deprioritization of career, is for about 24 months, uh, maximum 36 months. And for me, it was um, less than six months. In six months, I was like ready to go to take up the next big challenge and things like that. So it differs uh, women to women. But for most of us, um, in about a year or two, we want to get back onto the, uh, onto the race, okay, in, in our full gusto. And um, by that time, you know, you have given your best to your baby, and you really want to do it there. This period of time is what organizations need to find ways to manage. This 24 months period. And there are many ways in which one can do that. Uh, for instance, we have a mentoring program internally, uh, which we call internally called Inspire, where you have women who have gone through this journey offer mentoring support for younger women who can, who know who are either planning the family way or, or not yet there yet, but just so that their mind is conditioned to the thought that you go through this journey. But, but there is a period of time that you have to naturally prioritize this, and the organization supports you in this. In fact, our policy of um, the, the flexibility policy, the rating protection, as somebody mentioned, very important in any of this. All of this is encompassed in a policy that is called pleasant parenthood. So the organization values the fact that you are a parent. And why it's called a parenthood is because we wanted to make it gender neutral in many ways because the whole policy is designed as a primary caregiver and mostly the primary caregiver is a woman uh, especially uh, certainly in our country so as i was driving um, down one of my young uh, women colleagues who also happens to be the ceo club member she mentioned to me that when women return to work uh, yeah, in india uh, we are blessed, unlike in many other countries, with a lot of support from family. We have families, either indoors or parents. Um, we are able to find house help far more easily than uh, in many other countries where you, uh, you don't find it extremely difficult to get uh, domestic help. There are crashes in whichever way, either you know, home crashes or organized crashes. So actually, the ecosystem in many ways is supportive, provided the woman herself uh, wants to leverage that, okay, and and prioritizes her career during this period, and that's where organizations can play a role. Um, first of all, awareness on what is available to her as support, whether it is in terms of flexibility, mentoring, 
when she comes back, giving her a period of time, maybe a year or so, in a road that does not require her to travel as often, maybe. Or in our case, for instance, if you are in a branch, and we have uh, 8,000 branches across the country, um, what we offer as a strong uh, support is the fact that she can move to any part of the country and still have her job, because we can enable that now even uh, in smaller locations, the geographies, etc. So that's a huge advantage. Um, but the other part of that is that if you are in a branch, you need to be in the branch. You cannot do a hybrid, right? So, and by, by banking norms, you need to be there from whatever the banking hours. So in such cases, because we are a large bank and we have many operations and many backing functions as well, about 26% of our workforce is women out of the 240,000 uh, people that we may have. Um, it's possible for us to, for that period of time, allow the woman flexibility to go into another role, and then when she comes back, she can come back with uh, equal gusto. Protect her rating so that when there is a promotion eligibility at some point in time, she doesn't get uh, shortchanged because she had a year when she was away from work. I think things like these really help um, help young women stay yeah. and uh, thrive. And uh, young, and as I mentioned, mentoring. And not to underestimate that at all, because just talking to somebody during that period of time who have gone through that journey is tremendous confidence uh, for a young person. In addition, peer level support helps as well. So there are employee resource groups. So if you don't like mind the right uh, kind of setting, then you have young women who are going to similar stages in life, can connect with each other and just exchange notes. It could be even which is the best question in Bombay, for instance, or uh, in a day do you have a uh, crash or maybe even a party. Can I, can I find a maid or a house help close by? You know, these kind of things sometimes help um, more than anything else that you can put down. Um, we debate, for instance, a lot about uh, can we give uh, the woman uh, a certain child care support? And this came under tremendous debate. And one of the things that uh, women themselves. Yeah, time out, is it? Okay, then I But you know, we, we have this conversation, I, I don't want to then I see that I should give a ton of time to speak. Now, yeah. so I've been just to conclude for everyone, uh, you know, how, how do we measure the effectiveness of all this? Uh, how do organizations measure the effectiveness? Yeah, I see the red board there, so I'm going to keep it really short. You can have whatever measurement you want, but if you don't have the right tone from the top, and you're doing, not doing any of these initiatives from your heart, they're going to fall flat. But, but just to tell you the kind of measurement that we do at HSBC, because we strongly believe in measure what we treasure. We have a very strong tone from the heart. We bring our, a very strong tone from the top. We bring our heart to work. And then how do we measure it? We measure it by looking at numbers, hiring, promotion, uh, actually the whole gender ratio. We were amongst the first few global banks to actually declare our pay parity, uh, the pay gap analysis for about 80% of our population. We believe in measuring, our CEO has got targets where he measures not only diversity but including inclusion. Uh, so we work on lots of parameters, things which move the needle. And not only that, it's not only measurement of how we are doing as an organization, when we have our annual global people survey, we take feedback from staff to say how are we doing. Everything that we say on paper or we say that is happening, actually you experience it in your life. And those are the scores that actually contribute overall to the measurement that we do. So it's a complete 360 for ourselves. So. And I think transparency is the key there as well, you know, making it all available. No, thank you, thank you so much. I know we're out of time and we've taken a little more, but I hope some of these are interesting conversations and happy to, you know, have some discussions outside as well. Thank you. Thanks everyone.